Black Male Media Project is a program launched by the National Association of Black Journalists. Chapters across the country, even a group in South America, work to help combat the negative images of black men too often portrayed and reflect the true contributions of black men to their communities. We also provide critical support to black men building careers in media. Special thanks goes to our proud sponsor, Tegna Foundation, for the last four years. Because of them, we can inspire black men. We thank our president, Dorothy Tucker, for her commitment to the work of the Black Male Media Project. As president of the National Association of Black Journalists, I want to thank you for taking part in the fourth annual NABJ Black Male Media Project. My predecessor, former President Sarah Glover, came up with the idea to celebrate our black men, and I wholeheartedly support it. NABJ grew out of efforts to support a black male reporter by the name of Earl Caldwell. The FBI was trying to force Caldwell, who worked for the New York Times, to turn over his notes and coverage of the Black Panthers. Our founding fathers rallied behind Caldwell's right to protect his sources, and that advocacy indirectly led to the formation of NABJ. I am proud to see you continue to fight to make sure the stories of injustice to our fathers, uncles, and brothers are exposed, to push for fair and accurate portrayal of African-American men, and remind the world of the contributions of our beautiful black men. As a mother of two young black men, thank you for sharing your wisdom and donating your time. Enjoy the webinar. The reactions and indication that not even the country's first African-American president can change the dynamics, the fear, even anger, that too often define encounters between black men and police. Pretty surprised tonight that this platform will hold me because so many people are standing here with me tonight. This is an area, black characters, black actors, black male imagery, that we wanted to focus on. Then the taxpayers have the right to demand information, to demand justification. Good afternoon, NABJ. Good morning to those of you out on the West Coast. <clears throat> I am Bill Whitaker, correspondent for 60 Minutes. I'm your moderator today. Welcome to NABJ Black Male Project panel on how they see us. I can't think of a more timely or important discussion to be had. The hardworking brothers and sisters at NABJ who have been arranging this panel for months really did have their fingers on the pulse of the country. I can't imagine a clearer picture of how they see us than the indelible image of Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin with his knee on the neck of George Floyd. The whole world saw George Floyd gasping for breath, saying, I can't breathe, calling for his mother. It's stark, it's brutal, it's painful, it's infuriating, and that's, that's, that's not me saying it. It's millions of people of all colors in the streets of the U.S. and around the world saying it. And I can't think of panelists more appropriate to have this discussion than the men assembled here today. J.C. Watts, Jr., who actually has the coolest name of all of us, Julius Caesar Watts. J.C. was a quarterback for the Oklahoma Schooners. He's an ordained Baptist minister is a congressman from Oklahoma, and now is chairman of the newly launched Black News Channel, an independent minority-owned and operated network, the only one in the country dedicated to providing information for and about African-American communities 24-7. Also with us is David White, the National Executive Director and Chief Negotiator of Screen Actors Guild American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, 
SAG-AFTRA, the world's largest entertainment union with approximately 160,000 members worldwide, including me. They work in film, television, broadcast news, commercials, <coughs> music videos, and emerging media. We also have Dion J. Hampton, reporter with the Cincinnati Inquirer. He's working, working as a local government reporter for New York Newsday. Dion had impact. He led the investigative series that resulted in New York Governor Andrew Cuomo signing the Zombie House Bill, allowing towns and cities to reclaim abandoned properties from banks, so-called zombie houses, blighting many neighborhoods. Dion was part of a team that won two national awards for investigative reporting. Um, we're also expecting to have um, Wesley Lowry join us. He is uh, unable to join us right at this minute, but he may be joining us at some point through this uh, conversation. So uh, panelists, <clears throat> let's start where we must. The killing of George Floyd. That image elicits so many metaphors. At Floyd's funeral, Reverend Al compared um, Chauvin's knee on George Floyd's neck to America's knee on the neck of black America, keeping us down. So let me start with um, Dion. What does that image say to you about how white Americans see us? Well, wow, that's, um, that's interesting. Well, you would hope that that's not necessarily how white Americans see us, that they could just put their knee on our neck and just maybe treat us any kind of way but you know there's a lot of good white people out there so i wouldn't necessarily think that's the case but if i'm a black guy walking around town right now i mean you have to be a little bit nervous of just even going outside it seems like in the last couple of months you can't go jogging through your neighborhood or if you're brianna taylor well she was she the black woman but she was in her house you know they took her boyfriend to jail um in Minnesota over a $20 bill, counterfeit $20 bill. So if you're a black guy right now, you're really nervous and have been for a long time about the way authorities treat us. I mean, we're always told that, you know, the police officers are always there to protect and serve. But sometimes that's not necessarily the case, especially if you're a black man. Well, maybe they're not there to necessarily protect and serve you on your behalf if you're a black man. What do, you, what do you think, um, the officer, Officer Chauvin, knew he was being recorded. He's looking right into the camera, but he doesn't stop. What does that tell you? Uh, JC, you look like you were going to speak. I'm, I'm happy to wait for you, but I, I well, have a... Look, well, go ahead. David, Jason, David, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, David, thank you. Bill... About two weeks ago, and, and I'll admit, uh, it, it was only about two and a half weeks ago that I started wearing a mask. And, and rarely will you see me without a baseball cap on or some type of hat on if, if, if it's not Sunday. That's just kind of my nature. So I'm going into a grocery store. I've got shades on. I've got a baseball cap on. And I put my mask on for the first time. And it was interesting, the discussion that I was having with myself after I looked in the mirror to see what I looked like in a mask. And I literally said to myself, I, I, I've got to decriminalize myself. And, and I took the mask off and I literally kind of said to myself, I said, I, I'd rather take a chance on getting the virus than I would in getting shot. And so I took the mask off. Now, and when I went home and socialized that, I said, first of all, white men probably don't have to have that discussion with themselves. And I said, secondly, I need to wear the mask. So what I did the next, next time was I took my shades off so at least people could see my eyes and I, and I wore the mask and I left my cap on. But Bill, I think that's indicative of, of the type of discussion that black men are having with themselves uh, during this pandemic, and then it's been escalated to another level to show uh, what, how we might be seen in the public eye if uh, uh, just based on what we've seen with, with uh, 
Um, Ms. Arbery, what we've seen with, with Walter Scott, what we've seen with, with George Floyd just in the last couple of weeks. So, so Reverend King said slavery gave black people a stigma. It put a stigma on black people. And, and in many respects, that stigma still exists today. And I think we've seen it highlight and, and um, uh, surface again just over the last three months. You know, Bill, I would add to uh, the uh, both comments, uh, all of which I agree with, something that may be leading to your next question. Black men, African Americans, get it from both sides in society, right? So when my nephew visits out here from Kansas City, and I'm in Los Angeles, and he walks down three blocks, he's approached by other young black men who don't recognize him in their neighborhood, and they've got a question about him. And if he doesn't answer those questions correctly, that could lead to violence. He could go half a step the other way and be pulled over by the police because they see him in a particular light. And he could be in the grocery store with JC wearing a mask in order to comply with the rules related to the pandemic and also be stigmatized. So at some level, this isn't simply about how white people see black people. This is about the cultural transformation and then the structural transformation that will need to change in order for black people, black men, black women to have different status in our own society, including in the eyes of the people who are looking at us. We have now been joined by Wesley. Hello there. Hey all. Um, let me give you a little introduction. Wesley Lowry is um, a correspondent now with 60 in 6. It's a 60-minute spinoff on the new mobile app Quibi. He's a new colleague of mine that I have not yet had the chance to properly greet because he started just when this pandemic was breaking out and everything got shut down. So I hope to rectify that soon. I'm waiting, I'm waiting on it. <laughs> right. Wesley, um, before joining CBS, Wesley was a national correspondent for the Washington Post, primarily covering issues of race and justice. He was part of a team that won the Pulitzer Prize, not once, but twice. Wesley, we just heard before you, um, before we turned on, that you you were at the funeral for uh, George Floyd the other day. Yes, certainly. I mean, in fact, I'm here in Minneapolis still, um, and like, so my apologies for the delay. Uh, I'm still in the reporting a bit. You're working. Yes, You're working. <laughs> I got I got a source call at at quarter till and had to take it, and then realized uh, that it was ten after. <laughs> so, <laughs> my, my apologies. Uh, but, but we're working um, here in Minneapolis, uh, trying to tell tell the story of what's been going on. But yes, I spent I was at the funeral and spent a lot of time uh, with the Floyd family in these last few days. We were staying in the same hotel as them. Um, I've got longstanding relationships with their legal team as well as some of the other folks near them, and so I was <laughs> kind of. Uh, work my way as we do journalistically into their space and ended up having a, uh, a lot of um, kind of intimate time with them um, over these last few days. What, 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 can, you, what can you tell us? How, how are they? Well, well, you know, I've unfortunately spent a lot of time with families who are thrust into these types of stories. Right over the years, I've interviewed family members of Trayvon Martin or Michael Brown or Tamir Rice, right? Um, and no family under any circumstances Senses, deserves the trauma of losing a loved one this way in public and having to mourn in public. The Floyd family is the nicest set of humans I've ever met in my entire life. This is just a big Southern family of jokesters. They're showing me YouTube videos. They're, they had a party in the hotel last night. I mean, this is just salt of the earth, great people, heartbroken by what happened. Um, his son, Quincy, is at a really difficult time. Um, He's got, like I said, a big family of many siblings, so brothers and sisters who were taking it differently. Um, this, his death also happened just a few days before the anniversary of his mother's death. And so this was already would have been a hard week in their family. Um, but they are 
all, all, with all that said, doing pretty well. Uh, they've left Minneapolis to go to, to Houston, where they will have another memorial service. And then after that, they've got a third memorial service um, because the family is that big and that black and that Southern that they've got three different cities where they've got to make sure to, uh, uh, to, to, to remember him. And so, um, like I said, it, it's been a real privilege to be spending some time with them. Excuse me for the delay of doing the muting and the unmuting is a, takes a little bit of time. Um, you tell me, I, I saw a, a, a clip of George Floyd's little girl riding on, I believe, her uncle's shoulders saying, my daddy changed the world. It was, I mean, it was really moving for me. And I'm just wondering. Black reporters focus on issues like this all the time. Yeah. We've all seen the stories. They, you know, there's, there's outrage, and then it just sort of fritters away and goes back to the way it's always been. What about this time? You know, I hear this all the time, that this is different, that this is an inflection point. Is it? I, th I believe so. And, and the reason I would say that and I mean that journalistically, not just kind of as an opinion, by analysis based in reporting would say so. And the reason I say that um, is a few things. Um, but I think most crucially, it's because uh, for the first time in modern history, white people agree that enough is enough. Uh, when you look at the polling, um, the Monmouth has done a poll consistently. And it, and it often goes out into the field right after one of these incidents. Went out in the field right after Eric Gardner, went right out in the field after Philando Castillo. More white Americans today, I think it was 57%, polled literally last week, say that black Americans are treated unfairly by the police. That is the high watermark of our modern era. That's 20 points higher than it was when Eric Gardner was killed five years ago. Right, that's a monumental shift. A 20% shift among one subsection of the population is massive because what the polling has always shown is that black Americans have always believed this to be true. They've always known it, why? Because they're experiencing it. Of course the police treat you differently, they know it. They have, they have firsthand experience. White Americans have never believed that. They just ne the polling has shown the majority of white Americans have never believed there's actually a difference in the way black and white people are treated by the police. Um, what's interesting is the polling shows that that divide exists even among police officers. Black police officers say, yeah, no, 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 we treat black people differently. And the white police officers say, no, no way, right? That the racial divide is when you look at an issue of policing or criminal justice is essentially the only thing that matters. Black Republicans understand <laughs> that, uh, that the people are treated differently. Black police officers understand it. Rich black people, poor black people. It's white people who haven't accepted this. If you look at the demonstrations across the world, I, I was walked out of a room that had London live on, on air, right? Um, when you, every demonstration across the country, there are white people in the streets. <clears throat> that is different than it had been in 2014 in Ferguson, 2015 in Baltimore. I, and I could go on and on and on within all the cities. So uh, JC, uh, can you, reach back and put on your political hat. You're talking about wearing your hat. Can you put on your political hat? You tell me, I mean, if, if things are changing in the streets, what about politically? You know, when you look at Washington, you, you think, is this changing things? Well, Bill, to, to, to Wesley's point, I think there's a couple of things that's happened in the last month that, that I, I hold out a ray of hope that maybe this time it, it will be different. I think there's two things that happened with the um, Armand Arbery case down in Georgia, where you know it was exposed that that young man was shot and, and it was exposed after two months. There, there was a cover up for two months before that, that came to light. And had that person not come forward with, um, uh, with, with, with that uh, video, it, it, it still would have been under the table. And, and I think people saw that that was in your gut. I don't care who you are, what your political persuasion is, what your skin color is, that should have bothered you. If it didn't, that there's just something warped about your humanity. And then the George 
Floyd situation, uh, I think that incident, again, with, with his handcuffs behind his back, he's on his stomach, and, and the gentleman, the, the officer, those officers were standing there are kneeling with, the, with, and one with his knee on his neck. Again, if, if you can't say, if that doesn't bother you, you, you have no humanity. And I think those two things, I, I think, were, it, were similar to uh, the dogs and the water hoses being turned loose on black people in, in, in the 50s and in, in, and in the 60s during the civil rights movement. And I think those things, because the press highlighted those things, the dogs and the water hoses, I think that raised the conscience level. Black people were, 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 were knew that was going on, but I think other communities, it raised their conscience level that something is wrong. And, and, and I'm not painting a, with a broad brush to say that all police officers are like that. And I think we always have to be careful. My father was, was a police officer. Uh, but nevertheless, I think those two things, kind of along with the Walter Scott, um, um, you know, the other things that have happened, uh, Trayvon Martin, um, you know, those things, uh, Orlando Cast Castile. I think you, you couple, you combine all of this over the last four or five years. I hold out a ray of hope that it's not just black people that, that see this. And, and politically, you asked me about this politically, I, I think and, and, and I don't mean to, to, to be partisan here. I just, I just want to state the facts. You, you can't just say that racism exists in general terms. I, I think Republicans like to, you know, that they'll admit that racism exists, but just in general terms. Uh, they never want to admit that it exists specifically. They, they can never point, they, they're never willing to point to a specific instance racism, they just say it, it exists generally. I, I think over the last, you combine everything that's happened, starting with Trayvon Martin and, and so forth and so on, through George, George Floyd, I, again, I think the conscience level has been raised that this <coughs> isn't a general issue. There are specific instances of racism that uh, the African American community have, have, has to pay a dear price for. Uh. I just want to remind anybody who's watching, um, you can send in some questions. We will be able to take your questions after we get finished with our discussion. We will pick up questions that are sent in by anybody out there who is listening. Um, if, I can, yeah, if, I can, if I can jump in, you know, I, I'm not necessarily convinced much is going to change if I'm just being honest. Uh, I covered the Eric Gardner protest in Staten Island years ago when he was killed by several officers just because he was selling cigarillos. And, you know, every few years we see these type of outcries nationally where everybody will band together for a week, maybe even two. They'll march for a week, maybe even two, and then it'll die down. And time and time again, Eric Gardner, Trayvon Martin, I mean, the list goes on and on and on back to the civil rights movement where we've seen this story time and time again. Like I'm with you, JC, like I leave that little bit of hope, but, and I'm with Wesley on the fact that I, I see a lot more white people who are marching with the blacks. I was at the protest here in Cincinnati all last weekend and it was, the crowds were very much split. 50% white, probably 50% black, but you already see the momentum is slowing down. I think what made this so different is just how egregious it was, where you had somebody who was catching it on the camera and somebody was saying in the background, hey, man, you might want to take your knee off his neck. I had a friend who died just like that. Or you had another woman who said, hey, you know, I'm with the fire department. Check his post. And you had another minority there, an Asian man who they're talking to. And they're, at, they're pleading with him to somebody do something and nobody did anything. The fact that it was so bold and in your face that it forced a lot of people to react. But it's kind of one of those things where what happens three months from now, six months from now, the Black Lives Matter movement was birthed out of this five years ago or so. 
things tend to die down. I want things to change, but I'm not necessarily sure six months from now we'll live back at this and say, oh, well, you know, they're done protesting or not much has changed. I'm not still convinced. And I'd like to add that, Bill. Yeah, if go I, ahead, Bill. I, um, I, I, each one of the points touches on um, things that I'm sure a number of us are feeling in different ways. I really appreciate the the great data that uh, Wesley put in front of us just to talk about a true distinction between what's happening right now and what's happening in the past. Uh, but uh, like what Dion is saying, uh, we do have a very short attention span. Uh, one of the reasons I believe that so much attention has been paid on this, I mean, just the trauma of what we saw uh, for on through the video, but also everybody's at home. So the typical daily distractions that happen when you're not in shelter in, all of those aren't there. And so there's an even greater attention focus right now than usual. And maybe that will deepen the roots of this into consciousness. But I have to say, in order to believe that this is actually gonna to lead to change, I'm looking for some very specific things, some of which is happening. I'm looking for police reform, for a mayor and a city council to say, this is going to happen. We are actually seeing some police reform in a couple of different jurisdictions, which is positive. I'm looking for something that I haven't heard anybody focus on, which is police unions reform. I wanna see unions say, we will not back officers, and I run a union, right? So I, th this is hard, but we will not back officers that target and treat African Americans differently. I'm looking for the change in November for national leadership because that's symbolic, that, that casts a pall or it casts light over the country so that then the other thing that I'm looking for, which is local legislative change yeah. for police budgets and for other things. If, if it's not placed in, in um, areas that actually institutionalize change, then I share Dion's concerns. I have JC's hope, but, but I really think we need to see that. Hey, hey, yeah, yeah uh, go ahead, Wesley. Well, I was gonna say, I, I think those are all very strong points about what the next steps are and what they look like. One thing that's always important to remember about policing in America, it is a structural challenge. There are 18,000 police departments in the United States of America. There is no federal oversight of them, not expansively. The local police department sets its own training standards. Um, it hires and fires its own officers. It's, um, its local city council hire and fires its chief, or the mayor does. They enter their own local police union contract and they can negotiate in or out any of those things. And so there's not, in this moment, an easy mechanism for sweeping change that would cover the entire country. Now, you know, we, we do live in a democracy. There's a world where Congress could pass whatever bill they wanted for perhaps giving themselves more power, giving the federal, giving DOJ more power. Um, if we remember the Obama years, the patterns and practices investigations, when they would come in to Ferguson, to Baltimore, to Chicago, that power has only existed since 1994 after Rodney King, right? That was a very new juncture, right? And so perhaps there would be a world where uh, Congress might give itself or give the executive branch additional oversight of police, right? Um, and so, but I, but I do agree that it is difficult. We certainly have had moments like this. There's no guarantee. It's not easy. I say all that to say it's very difficult to reform 18,000 individual militias with local politics and local government and local union contracts, right? Um, and, and so there is a question of, can you do it that way? Does there need to be some big sweeping omnibus federal step taken? And I let folks who are, are activists advocate for that one way or the other. Um, but it, it is a really interesting moment. The one thing I am really interested in seeing if it helps keep up the momentum is um, we are obviously in an election year. And we are in an election year where the left broadly is extremely mobilized and extremely upset. A lot of the people out in these protests were out in these pro were, are upset about all types of things. They're upset about the children in the cages at the border. They're upset about Parkland and the lack of gun rights. They, they were there for the Women's March and are still horrified by the president and, and the statements we've heard on tape, 
right? You, you have a very activated, you have the Bernie Sanders people, but you have a very activated political center left. And, and what I'll also say is American police officers shoot and kill three people every single day. This is not gonna be the last name that trends between now and November. And, and so, and I hate that that's true, right? But it is, right? The, the, what we know statistically is we're gonna get another video. We're gonna see another case. I'm gonna parachute into a different city. And so there is a chance when we look at some of these other moments, Ferguson, the other ones we remember, it's when you have the quick secession, like we just did, right? Where it was uh, Ahmad down in Georgia, then you had Breonna Taylor in Louisville, then you had the Central Park case, you know, when you had, and then we get to George Floyd. Right. In quick succession, too. Yes. And so it's within those moments, and now that we're in a moment like this, it maybe it is one month from now, but if there's another video, if there's another case, a lot of that, it's going to re-energize people. Mm -hmm. uh, the families announced a march on Washington in August, late August. That could be another big mobilizing event. The same way post-Parkland, there was the big March for Our Lives in D.C. And so, again, it's going to be interesting to see, I think, one of the key challenges for the activists um, in this space is continuing to build momentum so that in the theoretical world, either this president or the next one is, feels forced to do something. Mm -hmm. um, it's gonna be really interesting to see how that, how that plays out. Before we go to the questions coming in from our, um, our viewers, I would just like to ask David, I mean, we're, we're talking about um, you know, everything in the political world. You're, you're out there in Hollywood. You know, um, you're talking about change and reform on the political sphere. What, what about in Hollywood? I'm, I'm old enough to remember um, Clint Eastwood holding his Smith & Wesson telling the black robbers, make my day. And um, what, what is or what can Hollywood do to help change that image of black men as scary? as criminal, and is Hollywood doing that? Yeah, such a great question. Whatever Hollywood is doing right now, it can and should be doing a lot more. So let's, that's first point. Can and should be doing a lot more. However, let us recognize a shift that has happened since digital platforms have become more dominant in the way that product is exhibited. Netflix, Amazon Prime, uh, platforms like this that are emerging allow for something that was not allowed for in the past, and it is making a difference in how Hollywood treats the storylines of people of color, and in particular, African Americans. Because before, when it was just ABC, NBC, CBS, people were looking for broad audiences, and the way that executives translated broad audiences was white, non-controversial, right? So even if you have the Cosby show, it's still the Cosby show geared in large part for a white, broad audience. Now what they look for are niche audiences. It's the one show that you like that gets you to subscribe to Netflix as opposed to doing something else. So there is a much broader range of storytelling, not just where you have black people in front of the camera, uh, but where the storyline, it's not just a sidekick, it's not just the lead, it's a story that, is, that resonates and is intended to resonate for an African-American audience or for audiences other than mainstream. When you add that to people who are rising, whether you're looking at an Ava DuVernay or a uh, 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 you know, even a, a Tyler Perry or what have you. I mean, these are individuals who you may like their their product or not like their product. You, some of it may resonate or not resonate, but there are now real people in front of the camera and behind the camera who have the space to tell stories and they are actually being picked up by people who want to hear those stories and they're making a press. So Hollywood has a lot more to do. The executive decision-making, the pipelining, for who actually gets a job, who's the decision maker, um, who's editing the story, et cetera. Those pipelines are narrow. They need to be expanded. There's a lot of chalk talk out there about it, and there is some, but not enough action. But there is some, there is some progress going on in the imagery and the stories that come out of this industry 
and into the world. I'm happy about that and very unhappy about the space between that and where we need to be, but it's moving. We are talking to a bunch of journalists and journalists are writing in and they want um, uh, some specifics. Hey, hey. I want to know one question from Skylar Henry. Uh, we have um, talked about moving on beyond um, our coverage, in terms of our coverage, doing more than just a mugshot. Do you think we, as an industry, have done a better job in terms of providing true context when stories like this one come about? Dion, why don't you take that one? Can you say the question again? I'm trying to make sure I understand it. It's about, are, are we, journalists, black journalists, um, doing a good job in providing context to stories like the one of George Floyd? I think so. From what I've read, I mean, I try to keep up with all the newspapers and periodicals out there. And I mean, it's tough on the black journalists right now because it feels like there's a war against black men and to a lesser extent, like black women. But um, on the other side, like who else to cover a black story than a black person? I mean, traditionally, if there was a black riot somewhere in the newsroom, the newsroom manager or editor will always send a black person out to go tell the stories. I think that us as black reporters, and from what I've seen so far, we've done a very good job of putting things into protest. I'll give you an example. Last Friday, a week ago, yesterday, I wasn't even involved in the coverage of the, of the, of the protest here in Cincinnati. So Cincinnati had its most destructive weekend in 19 years, almost two decades. Now, was it Atlanta or Philadelphia? No. Was it what was going on in Minnesota? No. But I can say over last weekend, there were about 80 businesses that was broken into. So originally, it was my weekend. I just kind of went out there just to see. I wasn't assigned to the story. I was just going just to observe. I didn't have anything else to do. But I know how these things typically go because I've covered these types of protests before. Now, everything went smoothly. I, I'm going to take a long time to take my point here, but everything went smoothly. Started at 6, 11 o'clock, everybody started to go home. 12 minutes later, I'm home. I cut on the TV, and everybody's looting and riding. And I said, well, what in the world did I miss in 12 minutes? From the time I got downtown to back home, what did I miss? Got in my car, went back downtown. And the first thing I said was, to answer your question, I had to draw a line and make a distinction. And the first distinction I did, it was very subtle. I said, you know... I was out here earlier for five hours and the people who I see breaking into these stores, I didn't see in the previous five hours. I'm kind of drawing a line between, okay, we have protesters and then we have people who were like looting. 90% of the people who were protesting had probably already gone home and by 11 o'clock at midnight had gotten into bed and gone to sleep. But then you had teenagers or I would say young adults, people between the ages of 18 and 25 who one, they're dealing with a lot of things with being inside the house with the coronavirus pandemic. They probably lost some loved ones. Um, we got a, we're in a, some type of recession. We have a bad economy where three out of 10 Americans are out of work. You, people have had cabin fever. You have all, then you got some hot heads out there, troublemakers who just looking to start trouble. There was a very distinct difference between the people who were breaking in the businesses and the people who were really trying to like peacefully protest. And that's what I've been seeing from some of my colleagues. And that's what I've been seeing from some of the other respected black journalists across the country to like make determinations like that and to draw a picture and say, okay, the same people who are looting are not the same people who are necessarily rioting. Or if so, we've heard this week that there's been some plants in there from the far right from the far left or just some knuckleheads who were just trying to gain some type of attention. But it's that type of nuances that I've been seeing from other black journalists like across the country. I think they're doing a good job right now of reporting this thing. And I Some other uh, journalists are asking things like, um, how do we as, as, as black journalists um, even approach this? Um, unless you're a commentator or write for the opinion page, we are trained to be dispassionate, uh, neutral observers, just the facts, man. Is it possible 
to be dispassionate about something like this, or is it even desirable for us to be dispassionate about something like this? How do you, how do you perceive? I'd be happy to weigh in on that. Um, well, look, for, first of all, you know, journalism can look differently for different types of people. And I always like to acknowledge that, right? What works for me or what is the expectation of my employer or my workplace might be different than yours and, and elsewhere. And also what I'm best at or what I'm best equipped for might be different than someone else's, right? And so it's not, all one, it's not always one size fits all. And I think that's important. Um, and there are people out there who might say, all right, I'm tired of the restrictions put on me. I'm going to go shift into a different position, right? Where I'm going to do more essay writing or I'm going to do more, you know, that's, that's an option, right? Well, what I will say though is, you know, one of the best editors I ever worked for gave me this advice after Walter Scott was killed in North Charleston. And I sent a tweet that was probably, it was too emotional by half. Um, and, and what it was, was I had said, I was describing the video and I, I, I declared that the video showed the officer planting the taser. It was, a, it was an allegation, right? Like maybe I didn't know what I didn't know. There might have been plant is a charged word. I don't know what was in his head, you know, but we all know how, how newsrooms work, right? We can kind of semantically and pedantically debate all types of things. Was it planting? Is it setting? Is it a, and he said to me, he goes, he said, you know, the more emotional the story, the less emotional the reporter. And I think about that all the time. If the facts are inflammatory, I can just list them for you. I don't have to say anything. I don't have to, I can just walk through what happened, fact after fact after fact after fact after fact, and challenge anyone to, to point out that, I, or to argue that I'm making it up, right? No, this is what happened, and then this is what happened, and then this is what happened, right? And I think that our, the facts are our friends these ways. The thing about it is, when we tell the truth, the facts are our friends. If what we are documenting is real life, it's what we're experiencing as black men and women, we know we're telling the truth. So we can just tell the truth. That's something that I, I said, it's something I think about a lot. You know, I, when, I, when I used to read the Washington Post, we would do a big project or I would do a big piece. One of the ways I would gauge if I had chosen the right topic would be if my responses on Facebook or on Twitter would be a bunch of outraged white people who had never heard of the thing before. Whoa, 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 the, the cops are stopping black people for no reason and like frisking them. This is insane, right? And then, and then a bunch of black people going, Washington Post discovered police brutality today. Look at that, like just mocking me, right? Like, and I go, perfect, I found the perfect story, right? Because what it means is that I have reflected something that is true of a minority population, and I've ex but that was unknown to the, to the majority. I've exposed a bunch of people to something that was true for a smaller set of people, right? And again, I could do that without ever having to, I mean, I, I, I am passionate, I get in it, I've been in a lot of these stories. I save a lot of my energy for the, when I'm actually interacting with the people, when I'm out at the protest, I'm trying to be empathetic and trying to talk to folks. I really, you know, I want them to see some of me. I want, it, I want to see all of them. But when I turn the camera or when I sit to write, I don't want any person to be able to discredit all of the truths in that piece because of one adjective I dropped in or because of one thing that I got little half over the skis and now they can argue all the, no, 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 no. The truth's too important. And so that's how I try to think about it. Excellent advice. Another question we're getting is sort of a number of questions about the same thing. How do you, in a newsroom, it's not a black, it's not, it's not J.C. Watts newsroom, how do you push stories that you know are important that your news director might not want to hear, but you, you know it's important? How do you push those stories without getting pigeonholed as the black reporter who's always going to go after the black story? when you know, as you were just saying right there, that this is an important story, whether they want to hear it or not. How do you go about that? Well, for me, at least, um, I don't mind being pigeonholed, right? Because I don't go after the black story, I go after the good story and the important story. City's on fire, I want to be on the airplane, right? And, and that, um, and, and look, I, I want to do the most important stories. If there's a subsection of, of Americans who are being mistreated, what could be a more important story than that, right? Um, I understand though, I've, I've been working in newsrooms with a different level of privilege in a way, right? I'm not working for a local affiliate. I'm not um, look at, working at a local paper anymore. Um, it is a different setup. And there is something to be said for the way that, especially when there's only one or two people who look like us in a newsroom, the way those folks can be treated and the expectations 
expectations of them. Um, there's, I think there is a little bit of a generation divide. You know, generations above me, my father was in this industry, um, and I've got a lot of friends and mentors um, a few years older than me, right? There was a big push for a long time about we don't want to get pigeonholed, we don't want to be the black people can only do black people stuff. Um, that's never been my mindset. My mindset has always been, I want to do the stories, I, I want to do all the important stories and the stories I'm best equipped to do. And if I'm the only one here who understands how blackness works, I guess, I guess it's on me, right? Um, and, and to be clear, that brings some value, right? I, I'm hearing from colleagues, that, I mean, I just left the, the Washington Post full time, I'm still doing some work with them, but I just left my, and the number of colleagues I've heard from who are still saying, asking my advice how to cover the story. They're, they're upset they can't walk to my desk and ask me questions, right? Be that person in the newsroom. You know, it's exhausting. And when we come into spaces like this that are all black, we can complain about how all of our colleagues are asking us all these dumb questions, right? That's fine. <laughs> but I would much rather, if I'm going to work at a place like the Washington Post or the New York Times or CBS News or wherever, right? I would much rather have people running up to me and asking me questions that makes the coverage better than them not them feeling that they can't do that and that's having worse coverage. Hey, Bill. I always figure, I always figure you're um, in the newsroom, you're at the table for a reason. Of course. Exactly. Use your voice. Hey, uh, Bill. JC, we're getting a number of questions. People want to know, there's one from um, Eddie Francis. It says, where does the rubber hit the road for citizens to make actual change? And then he say voting. But on what level? What, what level is most important? Local, state, or federal? And, and Bill, let me, let me just add a, a note to what, what uh, you just asked Wesley. The Black News Channel, we want those stories. We don't have you know, the space to tell every story that comes down the pike, but we want to tell those stories because we think they do often get uh, overlooked. I think um, you know, professional Black journalists, you know, they, they tell the stories, and, and I think it's a great line to say the facts are our friends, but you know, our demographic uh, wants those stories to be told and they feel like they can, you know, make, make up their own mind. But if we're reporting the facts, I, I, think, that's, I think that's good journalism. Now, where does, where does it begin, the, the, the change begin? I think voting on all levels are, are important. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things, if, if we go and we protest and we participate in, in, in the marches and we're not we're not registered to vote, uh, it kind of defeats, it, it, it defeats the purpose. Um, so not just federal level, but the state level, um, municipal levels, uh, as has been said many times before, you know, people gave their lives to make sure that the African American community has the right to vote. And I think that's one of the, the best ways that we can quickly make change and that standing in a voting line for an hour or two hours or for two minutes uh, to cast our vote for the candidate of our, of our choice. I think that's, that's critically important on every level. David, we have one uh, anonymous question here, but I, I think maybe uh, as someone who leads a large union, you might be able to answer. They're talking about like back in the sixties, there was, uh, the um, Martin Luther King marches. There was the NAACP, the Southern Christian Poverty. You know, there were organizations. Today, it seems to be amorphous. Uh, we're all talking to each other on social media, but there, there seems to be no, no, no center. They're wondering, is that a good thing? Because we're all talking to each other, but is it a bad thing because there seems to be no center? It's a real thing. It's a great question. It's certainly a real thing. So many of us who grew up, <clears throat> I was born in 68. So I, you know, I came into political consciousness in the, the 80s um, and the 90s and the 80s had the former president of the Screen Action Field, ironically, the only president of a union, Ronald Reagan, who then came in and dismantled uh, labor in many ways. There's a, there's a story there. Uh, um, <clears throat> but um, I remember that we grappled with a question that goes to the heart of this question right here, which is there was a clear destination point for the civil rights movement. It was civil rights legislation. It was voting rights legislation. Even Martin Luther King uh, and, frankly, uh, Malcolm X, right, after his transformation and prior to his death. But, but Martin Luther King was going into a labor 
um, organizing uh, initiative campaign when he got shot. But that was a period of time where we as a community and the leadership in the community was seeking the next clear destination point for there to be a convergence of these disparate groups that found their way to resolution of their differences in order to make a couple of things happen in the 50s and 60s. And I think right now, it's a good thing that we've got multiple organizations. It's a good thing that the leaders um, are on events, in events like this, come from similar institutions, have professional networks that allow there to be a true network of leadership so that people are able to um, have multiple touch points with one another and to develop professional and personal relationships with one another. But uh, the agendas continue to have a hard time finding a convergence of a destination point. So I think we are destined for a disparate set of agendas until we have that. And it requires, you take a moment like this, right? It requires an Occupy Wall Street, a Black Lives Matter, uh, whatever's going on right now to coalesce around a thing. And we're still seeking, in my view, we're still seeking that thing. Maybe if we're lucky, the thing becomes get the man in the White House out, put a man in the White House or a woman in the White House who actually is competent. And uh, my apologies for anyone who is on here who may like the man in the White House, uh, you know, kind of is what it is, uh, who knows what they're doing and, and real sort of shares American values. Um, but beyond a national election, we've, we've got to figure it out even if it's multivariate, we got to figure out a destination point that allows for convergence between those different agendas. I'm going to combine a couple of the last questions here. Um, you have had a, a number of people saying that as young journalists, they're affected by this personally. One was asking about the um, arrest of the CNN reporter, and others are just saying, what, what words of encouragement can all of you in all the different spheres give to young black journalists who want to continue in this career, but um, aren't feeling, aren't getting the kind of encouragement they might need from say their newsrooms, their news directors? I had a couple of questions like that. What words of encouragement can you give? Well, I, I can answer this. I would say that if you want to be a journalist, just know the risk and go out there and Tell the truth. It's not easy being a journalist. It's not pretty. It's late hours, sometimes sleepless nights. And I can tell you what's happening to journalists last week because I'm the journalist that you were speaking of. Last Saturday, widely known that I was tear gassed. The photographer that I was with was tear gassed. The reporter that I was with was shot with two rubber bullets all last Saturday. The other photographer that I was with was tear gas and shot with a rubber bullet. You have some of these, um, oh, and by the way, last thing, on Monday, the reporter who I was linking up with at a rallying point, seven minutes between the time that we called each other and said, okay, we're gonna meet at this point, he was arrested by the Cincinnati police and detained seven officers took him down. It's on Cincinnati.com if you want to see it. Seven officers. So if you're a young journalist out there, just know the reasons why you're getting into this industry. Do the best you can. Just know that sometimes you know, there's a risk to what you do. What I'm finding fascinating is that you know we're out here telling the police officers, hey, I have on a press badge. I'm a journalist. They don't seem to care. I was almost arrested on Monday. I told the police officer, I said, hey, listen, I'm a journalist. His response to me was, well, everybody wants to be a journalist. Everybody thinks they're a news reporter. And I said, well, but I really am a news reporter. And then I walked away and the officer told me, guess what? I won the battle. And he was saying that he won the battle for the simple fact that he 
told a reporter what to do and to walk away and there was nothing I could do about it or I was going to be, you know, threatened with arrest or potentially put into handcuffs like my colleague. So just if you get into this industry for the right reasons, follow your passion, do a good job, but just know it's not always picture perfect. Mm. We, we need to start wrapping this up, but very quickly, very succinctly, can anybody, I mean, just, you know, like in a sentence, what sort of words of encouragement would you give to these young black journalists out there who want to do one. what many of us are doing? So very quickly, I would say it's a sacred profession to get information to the rest of us and worth the risk. Be informed about how to protect yourself. <clears throat> and we're not alone. So whether it's through the community of SAG-AFTRA or some other professional community in ABJ, you are not alone. So don't allow yourself to feel alone. Uh, yeah, I would add, um, we need you. Uh, we need you. We, you know, our industry has, for years, we've begged our industry to diversify at, at the rank and file level, at the management level, the ownership level. It's refused. Uh, this question remains one of the key questions in all of American life and American society is what do we do with the legacy of slavery? To what extent have we created an equitable society out of what was apartheid government, right? The people in the streets would say, we have not done that yet, right? Um, but what we know is that our industry, despite the very <laughs> times polite and desperate pleas of those of us who've been trying to get it to diversify, has not done that. There's nothing more important for you if you are a black journalist Frankly, not just, I mean, we're in a black space, right? But this, but this is true of, of women, specifically of gay and lesbian women, of people who are, you know, uh, gender non-conforming, right? But immigrants, right? It, we are the ones with the expertise. And so, and, and we know that words matter, that journalism matters. It can change the world. And we are the ones equipped to do that work. And so those of you who are out there, who are young, who might get, feel scared by all this that's going on, know that, that we need you doing this work and, and, and we need you learning the basics. We need you working the job you're working right now. You're sitting there going, I wish I was out to protest, but I'm covering the school board meeting tonight. Well, look, I had to cover a lot of school board meetings. And, and that means that I can, when, when I show up at a public meeting now, I know how to source in that space. I know how to get the information I need to get. Right? I, so the work you're doing now to put the tools in your toolbox is the work that's gonna equip you to change the world. Uh, you know, and, and that day could come a week from now. It could come a month from now. It could come a year from now. Hey, hey Bill. Bill, I, I'm, I'm going to close by saying, uh, first of all, thank you to President Tucker and NABJ for, for doing this and allowing me to be a part of it with these uh, extraordinary men. And um, Bill, I see you on TV all the time and have admired your work, and it's good to see you today. You know, I, I, I would just say that, uh, you know, we've got a relationship with um, the National Newspaper Publishers Association and the stories that we've talked about and maybe the consternation or, or, or trying to get those stories told by the news director and getting them on air, or getting them printed. You know, we, we, want, uh, we want those stories. And, and I think uh, Wesley said something that, you know, I, I'm a, I have a journalism degree, but I'm, I'm not a journalist in the sense that, that um, the people on this um, panel uh, that you guys are, but I know one thing in journalism that, that always matters, and that's the facts. And, and often it doesn't, uh, sometimes the facts, if it's not told by a black journalist, the facts won't get out about the black community. I think we go a little bit further, we dig a little bit deeper when it comes to the African American community. And I think that's a good thing for the community and for us as, as uh, black people who operate in this space. So again, uh, President Tucker, thanks for the invitation to be a part of this today. Well, thank you, and thank you all. And we're hearing from our listeners and viewers here, great conversation, very candid, insightful, much needed, thank you. These are just a number of them coming in. Please, thank you very much. And so I must thank you. I do thank you. I think this was informative. I think it was needed. And I really appreciate you giving us your time today and your, your hearts and your information. And thank you very much. Thank you, Bill.
Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you so much for having us. Good being with everybody. And all the journalists out there, for the citizens of this country and world, thank you, really. <clears throat> Don't give up. Do not give up. It's good.